This is our news, the weekend edition. And on the broadcast tonight, a COVID-19 passenger among those citizens and residents returning home on Friday. Plus, the Minnesota administration marks three years in office. And more students registering for the Ministry of Education's virtual learning platform. Good evening, everyone. I'm Andrew Knowles, and thanks so much for joining us on this Mother's Day. Topping news tonight, repatriation flights to the Bahamas have been temporarily suspended. This after a COVID-19 positive passenger was among 183 citizens and residents who returned to the Bahamas on Friday. Prime Minister Dr. Hubert Minnis made the revelation during a televised address this afternoon. Dr. Minnis says it was discovered that an infected passenger was on the flight to Grand Bahama. We are investigating to see how the individual was allowed to board that flight. Three individuals traveled with this passenger. All four of these individuals have been tested again upon arrival and we are awaiting the test results. The 96 passengers on that flight will remain in quarantine and continue to be monitored. Repatriation flights will resume once health officials advise. The Prime Minister also announcing new emergency power orders, which have been significantly expanded in scope to accommodate the business openings permitted since May 4th. However, he did make one thing clear as it pertains to gaming houses. They were never intended to apply to the operations of gaming houses. And this is now abundantly clear by the provisions of Part B of the order. Those provisions specifically state that permission to engage in home delivery and curbside pickup services do not apply to gaming house operators. The new order also sets out protocols which govern the process of repatriating Bahamians and designates the Civil Aviation Authority as the sole government agency authorized to approve any incoming flights and all air traffic within the Bahamas. Following the controversy surrounding Health Minister Dr. Dwayne Sands and his decision to allow six permanent residents on a private aircraft to disembark, there have been many questions about the number of individuals allowed to enter the Bahamas prior to the general repatriation exercise. This afternoon, in response to the questions which have arisen, I wish to advise that over the emergency period, a total of six other persons comprised of six Bohemian citizens, one permanent resident, and three work permit holders, being skilled technicians contracted to conduct specialized emergency work for utility services were permitted to enter the Bahamas. Meantime, there were no new cases to report today. It represents the fourth consecutive day without a confirmed case of COVID-19. Well, the Prime Minister also revealed during his national address this afternoon that unemployment could rise to a whopping 30% due to the thousands of workers who have been laid off or lost their income due to the coronavirus pandemic. We are in very difficult and uncharted waters. Based on applications to NIB, more than 25,000 people have been laid off or have lost their income to date. This number will likely increase. The initial numbers from the Treasury indicate that the tax revenues for April were just about half of what was collected in April of 2019. Our unemployment rate in the near term 
will likely exceed an unprecedented and extraordinary 30%. Well, today marks three years since the Free National Movement was whisked into office, winning 35 of the 39 seats in Parliament. The Minister Administration's team, term rather, in office has been anything but a walk in the park. Al Kyle Joaquin takes a look. The feeling, I'm ecstatic, I'm ready to go to work for the people yeah! of Santa Rita. It was perhaps the biggest surprise of that general election, the defeat of former Prime Minister Perry Christie, who after holding the Centerville seat for 40 years, lost by four votes to political newcomer Reese Chipman. It solidified the FNM sweep at the polls, leaving the Progressive Liberal Party with only four seats in Parliament. Since then, the road for the FNM has not been easy. For starters, Chipman has already left the party and now sits in Parliament as an independent. But that was only one of numerous resignations that rocked the FNM. Following days of speculation, Cabinet Office announced this evening that Brent Simonet has resigned. St. Anne's MP Brent Simonet's resignation as Minister of Immigration was the second time he resigned from a Cabinet post. But there were also the terminations of three FNM MPs from their government-appointed posts. Vaughn Miller, Travis Robinson, and Frederick McElpine suffered the consequences for voting against an increase in value-added tax. You can fire me. But I've been living long enough to know that I've seen people fire people and the people who fire the people, I've watched the people fire them. But perhaps one of the biggest departures for the Minnesota administration was the recent resignation of Dr. Dwayne Sands as Minister of Health after he took responsibility for allowing six Americans to disembark a plane, something the Prime Minister said was a breach of protocol. The decisions are made on the spot. I take full responsibility for it. From the Oban blunder to the controversial purchase of the Grand Lucayan Hotel, to even the move to place some senior officers of the police force on pre-retirement leave before they were eventually reassigned, some decisions made by the Minnesota administration weren't so popular. Then there was the battle on the labor front where some of the country's most critical workers took industrial action. No one started the new shift system underneath this BNU and no one will start that shift change. Despite what everybody else is saying and what persons are saying that this is all about money, this ain't about money. This is a principle. This is a fundamental right mm -hmm. that every Bahamian is afforded under law. And who could forget the two failed cases against a former cabinet minister and a former PLP senator and the questionable involvement of sitting cabinet ministers. There will be many, many opportunities to speak about what has happened over the recent months since the general election. But the Minnesota administration has also suffered some setbacks since being elected. Take, for instance, dealing with the deadly Hurricane Dorian that took the lives of dozens of Abaco and Grand Mahama residents, with many still unaccounted for. The estimated damage caused was $3.4 billion. I understand the deep frustration of those who have had to deal with bureaucratic roadblocks. We are aggressively shredding the red tape that is frustrating many who want to help. For many on Abaco and Grand Bahama still recovering, there is a fear of what's to come with the 2020 Atlantic hurricane season just weeks away. And now a global pandemic where the financial blow is expected to far outlast the health crisis. The reality is that COVID-19 will be with us for the foreseeable future. But there have been some major victories for the FNM government since taking office three years ago. There is the transformation of the New Providence landfill and the job done to prevent the once frequent fires that plagued nearby communities. There's also the move to make tertiary education free for Bahamians, the passing of the Fiscal Responsibility Act, as well as a record number of tourist arrivals in 2018. The major reduction in crime, also a positive. We're introducing CCTV, we're introducing body cams, where we're coming very shortly with video cams, okay, where we, we started uh, tape recording, uh, video recording interviews. So all of these is in an effort to bring about a higher level of transparency. Government has also made progress on the marijuana front, establishing a commission and accepting recommendations. And as the government moves into its last two years of this term in office, there are quite a few promises left outstanding, like campaign finance legislation, a recall system for non-performing MPs, term limits for prime ministers, 
and full implementation of the Freedom of Information Act. For our news weekend, I'm Kyle Walker. Well, the Ministry of Education recording a boost in students utilizing the virtual classroom via channels provided by Cable Bahamas. The Bahamas Learning Channel, Channel 295, assists students who don't have access to devices. According to Education Minister Jeff Lloyd, an additional 15,000 students have registered for the virtual classroom sessions, bringing the total number to 45,000. Now we have about 45,000 students registered on the virtual school. Big time. Wonderful day. That number is expected to climb as the ministry officially launched live sessions for the primary, le primary level. Live sessions for the primary school begins. Now this is really a glorious time. Remember there was a live session for the secondary schools. But uh, today the live sessions for the primary schools begin on uh, channels 295 and in the Family Islands channel 2. So very, very excited about that. So that means now all of our students are able to um, access live instructions every single day. The Ministry of Education partnered with Cable Bahamas and Alive to provide tablets for some 5,000 students who were not able to utilize the virtual schooling due to a lack of internet cable or device access. According to Lloyd, those tablets are now here and are being uploaded with the app so students can access the virtual class sessions. Tablets are going to be in town and uh, distributed beginning uh, the middle to the end of next week. We already have in-house uh, half of the tablets, but we want to make sure that we have them all and that Alive uh, loads them as they ought to with the hot, hot spot. You all know what that means, as well as um, the app for the access to the, uh, to the virtual school. Meantime, medical professionals have had to adjust to a new way of providing healthcare services to patients. That according to the CPSA president, who says they are constantly reviewing protocols. I think we're all getting used to what could be our new normal. Um, certainly this has been a change for all of us. Um, we have moved from when there was the hurry-burry of busy of what should be happening and what should be going on into now, trying to strategically plan because of the reopening of the country, how we're going to now get patients in who need to be seen, who were not able to have been seen during the time, trying to offer other services like telemedicine, etc. So we're, we're in that mode. Dr. Pinla Butler added that added the CPSA is advising physicians not to let their guard down even when away from their practice. We continue to advocate and encourage our physicians not to let their guard down so when we encounter patients, make sure that the proper personal protective equipment is used as best as possible. We understand that things are spreading in the community, so certainly even when we're out amongst our family members and friends to continue practicing the social distance um, measures that we've been promoting, continue to practice hand washing and all of those appropriate things so we could continue to uh, try to mitigate the things that can be related to COVID-19. Following the, following the European Union's decision to blacklist the Bahamas, Progressive Liberal Party Deputy Leader Chester Cooper says it is outrageous that the European Commission would seek to unilaterally level heavy-handed sanctions by way of another blacklist. Berthony McDormand has more. PLP Deputy Leader Chester Cooper expressing concern over what he termed attacks by the European Union. His comments come after the EU originally placed the Bahamas on its blacklist yet again. In my statement, I expressed concern that in the midst of the COVID crisis, we are still uh, seeing these attacks by the EU and other international bodies. So this is a general concern for me. Uh, it's a concern for the opposition and a concern for the industry at large. Cooper added that there have been various legislative reforms in an effort to meet EU standards. He says it's now up to the government to explain how the country fell into this position. Attorney General Carl Bethel recently told reporters the government was blindsided by the move. I noted the surprise by the Attorney General and I was quite frankly uh, surprised given that we have a, a full-time ambassador on an embassy in Brussels whose mandate it would be to deal with these matters proactively. Given that we have friends in the international community, I'm surprised that the AG is surprised. 
This is not the first time the Bahamas has found itself in a similar situation. In February 2019, the Bahamas was listed as one of 23 jurisdictions that have been blacklisted for the Strategic Deficiencies in Anti-Money Laundering and Counter-Terrorist Financing Framework. In December 2019, the Bahamas was again blindsided by a blacklisting by France. The Shadow Finance Minister worries the blacklisting will make the Bahamas a less competitive jurisdiction. If you are a, a wealthy investor, you do not want to be invested in a country uh, necessarily where there's going to be increased scrutiny by your tax authority. The reality of it is that it makes us less competitive. And therefore, what we, what we need to do is to respond in kind with very uh, nimble uh, strategies to, to pivot in this industry. Reporting for Our News, I'm Berthony McDermott. We'll still ahead tonight. How COVID-19 has changed the way Bahamians worship. Plus, why the Real Estate Association isn't impressed with the new rental assistance program. Those stories and more coming up when we return. Next tonight, the COVID-19 pandemic has changed the face of worship, according to the Christian Council president, who said technology is driving efforts to bring church services to the public. Our Georgie O'Bain reports. The COVID-19 pandemic has changed our way of life as we know it. This will include the face of worship, according to Christian Council President Bishop Dalton Fernander, who compared the effects of 9-11 and the COVID-19 virus on the church. In the near future. Uh, it, is, it is, if it is to be compared to 9-11, 9-11 uh, had an effect on the world, but it didn't have an effect on the way churches worship. Um, during 9-11, um, it was not a closure of the churches, but the borders and was not closed. And screening and the way we travel was changed forever. I do believe that the use of technology in worship is here to stay. Uh, it's not going to go anywhere. They're always going to be live streaming. They're always going to be giving by means of technology. They're always going to be reaching out to your members by the use of technology. With churches conducting virtual services for members to enjoy safely at home, Fernando said what has happened is that members now have a desire for physical worship, despite their fears of the deadly disease. That has forced the church to move into an era, particularly in the third world nation, that we were slowly creeping towards. Now all of us have been challenged to run in that direction. And so for me, as it relates to the church, some things will remain, but some things I think uh, will become stronger, more appreciated. I think what you're feeling right now is a real appreciation for physical worship. Fernandez Church, New Destiny Baptist Cathedral, can hold up to 2,000 people per service. With 30% of the congregation not allowed to attend due to new social distancing laws, Fernandez said it will be a gradual process to get churches filled again. Uh, people might have in the time past, uh, you know, I'm too busy, I'm too occupied. But right now, there is a strong desire to return to the places of worship because as it was in ancient days, they symbolize a hope. Um, that, you know, he doesn't live in those buildings, but those buildings recognize and have been set aside as the mission houses of those that will come in, be restored, and go out and help others. So no fear that church buildings will be empty and persons will prefer to stay home? Oh, that, that will happen. That will happen. This will be a gradual coming back. Um, I don't think any church will be first, uh, totally filled. I, I take that back. We might be filled because our capacity has been reduced. Reporting for Our News Weekend Edition, I'm Georgie O'Bain. When Our News, the Weekend Edition comes back from the break, why the Bahamas Real Estate Association says government's rental assistance is still not working. And later, we take a look at the most memorable quotes of the week, so stay tuned.
Welcome back to our news, the weekend edition. Two weeks after Prime Minister Dr. Hubert Minnis announced details for his government's rental assistance program, President of the Bahamas Real Estate Association, Christina Wallace Whitfield, says feedback from realtors and tenants has been dismal. Rental assistance, it's, it's so hard. You know, I, I understand that the Prime Minister and the government have put, you know, certain measures in place. Um, but there are a lot of people out there that um, are, are hurting and financially in a bind. And, you know, trying to make the decision to, you know, pay the rent or do I get food? Last month, Prime Minister Dr. Minnis announced that landlords of residential tenants in good standing up to March who were affected by the COVID-19 crisis must defer 40% of their rent for the next three months. At the time, Wallace Whitfield insisted the rental assistance policy was nothing more than a band-aid. The policy applies only to Bahamians or illegal residents with a monthly rent of $2,000 or below and allows for them to repay the deferred a month over 12 months. Wallace Whitfield says many renters are looking for cheaper options instead of deferring payments. This is one of the reasons why, you know, us, you know, the licensed agents out there, you know, we need to make sure and, you know, help and assist those that are looking uh, because they, they may need to get out of a situation where the rent is too high. So, you know, they're calling us daily to say, look, could you find something just a little cheaper? You know, we, you know, we can't do this, so they need to, to move. Find out the most memorable quotes of the week. That's coming up when our news, The Weekend Edition, returns. Finally tonight, it's that time when we take a look back at the most memorable quotes of the week in news in our Quote of the Week segment. Coming in at number three is Charlotte Williams, the cousin of the man who was stabbed to death on Wednesday. It's going to be hard. It's really going to be hard. You can understand if someone was a troublemaker and they deserve what they get, because they say you live by the sword, you die by the sword. But if a person didn't live by the sword and die by the sword, you have a problem with that. He ain't even a fighting person. I probably could have handled them three persons, three guys for him, because he, he don't fight. I'm more of a little fighter than he was. I can tell you the type of person he was. You understand? He was humble. The number two spot goes to Education Minister Jeff Lloyd, who says the opposition should have nothing to say about Health Minister Dr. Dwayne Sands' resignation based on a lack of credibility. All of the naysayers, and you know precisely what I mean, who does not have a moral inch on which to stand cannot say the same. And they have had the opportunity to demonstrate their moral fiber of accountability and integrity and have failed in every instance. But it was the resignation letter by Dr. Duane Sands that takes the top spot for Quote of the Week. I acknowledge that my actions have caused embarrassment for which I express sincere regret. We continue in the midst of a most serious pandemic when focused attention should be, tra should be trained only on how best the spread of COVID-19 might be slowed and eventually stopped. I believe that my continued presence in the cabinet may serve as a distraction from our effort and hence I offer my resignation from your cabinet. Well, that does it for our quote of the weekend. Other stories making news this evening. Our weather forecast is up next.
And that's our news, the weekend edition for this Sunday. I'm Andrew Nault. On behalf of all of us here at Our News, thanks for watching, and we'd like to wish all mothers a very happy Mother's Day, especially mine. Let's remember to be safe and look out for each other. Have a great night.